To all who come to this happy place, welcome. You guys want to know why Epcot is the worst park in Walt Disney World while simultaneously being my favorite and also the best park at Walt Disney World? It's a little something I like to call a sponsorship system. No way the audio sounds good now. If we turned back the clock to the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, we can see where this idea of the sponsorship system for Epcot began. You see, if different brands wanted to get their names out there, get more attention toward their products, they would sponsor a pavilion at the World's Fair. And while the sponsors got to advertise and usually sell their merchandise and products inside of these pavilions, they also funded the construction of the pavilions themselves. Like how It's a Small World at the Fair was sponsored by PepsiCo. Walt viewed the World's Fair, in addition to a way of showing the world what the Imagineers could do, as a way to build and develop attractions for Disneyland on someone else's dime. And when Epcot opened in 1982 at Walt Disney World, it was viewed as sort of a permanent World's Fair. And like a real World's Fair, Disney wanted different companies to sponsor all of the pavilions, and for the most part, that's what happened. Bell System, which today is known as AT&T, sponsored Spaceship Earth. The Land Pavilion was sponsored by Kraft, in case you wanted some mac and cheese. And in 1989, over in a little quiet corner of the park, the Wonders of Life Pavilion was open, sponsored by MetLife. Look at that, everybody. It almost took me two minutes to get to the point of this one. This video, as it turns out, I guess, is about the Wonders of Life Pavilion and how the sponsorship system and what I like to consider a perfect storm of problems led to its eventual closure and replacement. And I've decided to call it the Blunders of Life. That's as good as it gets here, people. The one thing you will not see in this pavilion is four undertakers again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of the grand dedication opening of the Wonders of Life. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day at Epcot Center and invite you now to follow us to the Wonders of Life. Horizons, The Living Seas, and of course, The Wonders of Life Pavilion opened in the later half of 1980 as part of a Phase 2 plan for Epcot. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Epcot Center. I don't know why they'd call it that. It sounds like it's somewhere you'd go if you wanted to have a business meeting. And all three Future World Pavilions had something massive to boast on their opening day. Horizons had a state-of-the-art dark ride building off of the Carousel of Progress. The Living Seas had the largest saltwater tank aquarium in the world at the time of opening. And The Wonders of Life had a revolutionary ground breaking new simulator ride. But trust me, it blew everybody's minds back then. It was the biggest thing in Epcot. We'll get to that a little later, though. The idea for the Wonders of Life Pavilion came about even before Epcot Center was built. But because no corporate sponsor could be found to help build and pay for the pavilion, they held off until Phase 2 of Epcot Center. Some people would say that Epcot was a lot more about education back in those days, and those people I think would be wrong. I think Epcot is very much still an educational park, what with all of World Showcase teaching you about the cultures of the world and how we're alike and how we're different, while also the front of the park, Future World focuses on education about all of us all around the world, like with Spaceship Earth or Living with the Land. While the majority of Epcot looks outward to the future and to other cultures, the Wonders of Life Pavilion instead would look inward, focusing mainly on nutrition and health in the human body. And when MetLife, an insurance company, finally signed on to sponsor the pavilion, the Wonders of Life opened in 1989, and it very much kept with the concept art of being a a festival about health. The design, if you look into the pavilion, seems very much inspired by the Carousel of Progress, and there was a massive mobile hanging from the ceiling. But honestly, for me, it looks like they were going for a sort of 90s shopping mall sort of vibe. Inside on opening day, you would find five different attractions, which sounds like a lot, but three of them were shows. Not saying shows are bad, I'm just saying they're a little easier to put together than rides. The first movie was called Goofy About Health, and it was an animated show with various different screens all around the theater, showing how unhealthy a lifestyle Goofy was living and how he fixed it to boost his energy levels and live a happier life. Yes, the king is returning to his castle. Triumph after a day of battle, full of vim and vigor. 
And although the actual theater and the set for the show were really well done and interesting, the movie itself was just a bunch of clips of different old Goofy cartoons spliced together. And if you've seen one Goofy cartoon, you've probably seen them all. Even though they're all fantastic. You also had the Anacomical Players, an improv show that told jokes about the human body, pictured here with their weird outfits. They performed their first show in 1986 when the Pavilion opened, and their last in 2007, seven years before the Pavilion closed for good. Now we get to the weird one, another animated show called The Making of Me, telling the story of conception and birth. I'm not saying this show is bad, it's actually wonderfully animated, but it's kind of weird just having it sit right in the middle of Epcot. Just trying to enjoy my day, man. The film stars an actor widely known and praised for his appearance in O Canada, over at the Canada Pavilion, Martin Short. There was, of course, a parental advisory pasted outside of the theater telling parents what they were about to watch. But honestly, if I had to choose between sitting in a classroom with an underpaid teacher who obviously does not want to be giving this talk, or watching world-renowned actor from the Canada Pavilion, that's right, Martin Short, giving a presentation on it that's also sort of animated, probably take the second one. Doesn't matter if it's sort of a weird thing to have at Epcot, I'm choosing Martin Short every time. But now that we've talked about the three movies and stage shows, let's talk about the actual rides. Well, one of them is a ride, the other one's a, uh, still a show, but with a little higher budget. Cranium Command is the only surviving attraction from the original 1978 plan for the Wonders of Life Pavilion, or the Health and Fitness Pavilion, or the Human Dynamic Pavilion? Dang, this thing had a lot of names. Originally titled Head Trip, which I think is the most 80s thing I've ever heard, it would share a theater with another show about dental hygiene called The Tooth Follies. The second show, obviously, never ended up coming to fruition, but the first one did, under a very different name and a different pretense. The show was designed by my personal favorite Imagineer, Rolly Crump, and would feature three different audio animatronics, sort of Inside Out style, dedicated to emotion, intellect, and the nervous system. With emotion and intellect playing off each other with sort of a left brain, right brain style comedy, and the nervous system would be kind of anxious and shy the entire time. Do you understand the joke now? You may laugh. Eventually, of course, though, we all know they couldn't find a sponsor and the entire pavilion was put on ice until the mid-80s, when it was revived by one Michael Eisner. Imagineer Steve Kirk replaced Rolly Crump and modeled his idea of the head trip after Reason and Emotion, an old Disney animated short. Which, yes, also went on to inspire Inside Out. It all kind of comes full circle here, not just the pavilion shape. Originally, the new version of Headspace was supposed to be sort of a Star Trek parody, where you'd have a captain ordering around different parts of the brain in order to make a fully functional human being go about their day. Eventually, the budget cuts hit, and they were only allowed to have one animatronic in the show, who became the lovable Captain Buzzy, although the final idea of the human brain being sort of a spaceship made it through to the final cut. Cranium Command would open and close with the rest of the pavilion in 2007. It didn't close as much as it was abandoned, and you could still sneak backstage and catch a peek at Captain Buzzy, illuminated by one dim light. Although you should not do this, and now you probably cannot do this with the play pavilion coming and everything, but that's, that's for later on in the video. I'm getting ahead of myself. Spoilers. In December of 2018, 11 years after the closing of the show, it was reported that the Buzzy animatronic was stolen from his perch. Now I have a couple of gritty detective videos all about Buzzy and trying to find him and interviewing people who may or may not have taken him. And I will link those in the description down below if you're interested in checking up on them, but I do have my suspicions as to where he is, and if somebody did take him, who took him? But that's enough about Cranium Command, let's go ahead and shift to the ride that made the Wonders of Life Pavilion worth a visit for most guests. <laughs> so, mm, sorry. What's that, Star Tours? I've never heard of it. If you wanted the premier simulator attraction at Disney World, you wanted to go to Epcot and ride Body Wars. What started off as one of Disney's most interesting dark ride concepts ever conceived, you get it? Cause the making of, yeah, never mind. Eventually evolved into a copycat of Disneyland's and Hollywood Studios version of Star Star Tours. They even opened the same year in Orlando. This one though was very much more science fact instead of science fiction. If you consider being shrunken down by a shrink ray then entering somebody's body to remove a splinter science fact. Which I do. I do. Originally, the idea was to have it be a dark ride titled The Incredible Journey Within, where you would travel alongside other guests as you got smaller and smaller 
and smaller inside the human body. It served as sort of a spiritual successor for Adventure Through Inner Space, which was eventually replaced by Star Tours. Huh, small world. Ironically enough though, this was replaced by Star Tours at Epcot. And because you were floating through veins in the beating heart of somebody else's body, the ride became sort of a vomit machine at the Wonders of Life. And cast members were trained to watch guests who may not be feeling very well and stop the attraction before any spillage occurred. Honestly, I refuse to even get on Star Tours these days. I cannot imagine imagine how Body Wars would have made me feel. Not good. But because Star Wars opened the very same year and revolved around a much more popular idea, or IP, Body Wars never got the amount of riders Disney was really hoping for. Even though, yes, it was one of Disney's most popular rides at Epcot back in those days. That's how bad the park was doing. So a pavilion full of shows no one really wanted to watch and an attraction that was done better over at Hollywood Studios, the wonders of life's days were numbered from the very beginning. Beginning. And now everybody, we get back into the sponsorship system. If you look at this graph here that I made, you can see that the sponsorship system didn't really work out very well for Epcot. You see, if a sponsor comes in and helps build a pavilion, it seems really good off the bat. You don't have to spend as much money constructing the pavilion and making the rides inside. But then comes the problem of adding in the advertisement. And of course, if the sponsorship were to drop, the ride and the pavilion loses funding completely unless you find a new sponsor or decide to fund it yourself. In 2001, after the sponsorship was dropped, the decline of the pavilion became very apparent. A thick layer of dust began to cover the circus tents and the mobile up above. And because nobody was really visiting the pavilion, Disney decided to make it seasonal in 2004. Basically, it now served as a place to help boost the capacity of the park during the busy season. And if you remember the name Stitch's Great Escape or Primeval Whirl, you know what happens to attractions that begin to operate seasonally. Seasonally, right? When it closed in 2007, Disney gave no official reason for it, but I think we can all kind of guess what it was. And the Wonders of Life became a sort of corporate event hall where if you wanted to hold a corporate event with your job and have some very boring meeting talk, you could do it inside the building that used to host Body Wars and Cranium Command. Over the years, Disney slowly began to empty out the pavilion and it was transformed into the Food and Wine Festival Center. That being the one time I can remember being inside Wonders of Life. In the following years, they stopped even using it as a festival center, and it just sat there, empty, dark, and kind of foreboding over in the corner of Epcot. In 2019, Disney announced a new play-themed pavilion would take over the former Wonders of Life. This one, judging by the concept art, being heavily inspired by the movie Ralph Breaks the Internet, which, if you guys know me, you know I... Didn't really like that movie, but granted, the look and feel of that movie were really unique, and I think it'll fit in well in Future World. Just, uh, Disney, I hope you know that emojis won't age well at all. Of course, though, now with our current situation and tourism being down the way it is because of the, th you know, thing, while the Play Pavilion was supposed to open with Disney World's 50th anniversary in 2021, really, everything's up in the air now. Will the Play Pavilion open with everything Disney promised and be better than we all could have imagined? Will it open sort of half-baked, with its budget being slashed and having just enough in the pavilion to keep people busy, or maybe the curse of the Wonders of Life pavilion will continue and the play pavilion will be cancelled and the space will just continue to sit empty for years and years until they finally put it out of its misery and tear it down or put something else there. Honestly, I think we will be finding out very, very soon here what Disney plans on moving ahead with and what they don't, like Spaceship Earth, how their renovation was sort of delayed or pushed back. But let me ask you this, this is sort of a two-part question. If you ever visited the Wonders of Life Pavilion, what was your favorite show or attraction inside? Was it Body Wars or Cranium Command? Maybe the making of me if you were freaky? Or part two here, if you've never been to the pavilion, what do you think? think happened to Buzzy? Do you think it was just an honest mix-up and Disney has him somewhere in their archives and they didn't tell some sort of team who was supposed to look at it at some point in time, or do you think someone actually stole the animatronic? Like I said, I have my suspicions. But thank you for joining me on this trip through the history of the Wonders of Life Pavilion. And I think after the end of all of this, I can positively say that the sponsorship system for Epcot and also the budget cuts that were sweeping through Imagineering at the time were responsible for the blunders of life. See, I brought it full circle. Hello everybody, thank you for watching my video titled The Blunders of Life. I figured this was a pretty 
funny title. Hey, I, I, I liked it. What you're seeing scroll past right now are the names of my Patreon patrons. These wonderful people who pledge even just one dollar over at my Patreon, linked in the description down below, got a sneak preview of this video earlier on in the week. If you're interested or want to be a part of that, go ahead and visit that link, and like I said, even just one dollar you'll get access to all of the perks. M most of the perks. If you're new here or you like this video, hit the subscribe button and that like button. It really helps me sort of gauge people's reactions and what they thought of these videos. So it really helps out the channel and it's pretty quick and easy for you guys to do. So just do it. It's easy. Just do it. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.